Thank you, Zach. Thanks yeah. so much. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. Good morning. How are you all doing today? So I'm Ramez Nam. Can we get my slides up here, possibly? I'll sing and dance, tap dance. OK. I'm going to talk about the future of the brain, and I'm going to go a little further out than most of what we're going to talk about over the next two days. By introduction, uh, I teach at a place called Singularity University in Mountain View that many of you know. We talk about exponential technologies to solve humanity's grand challenges. I'm also an author, uh, and most of my books are science fiction. So in my novels, Nexus is the first one, people have a technology in their brain. They consume it as a liquid that crosses the blood-brain barrier, self-assembles into uh, nano-devices attached to their neurons, and with this technology, it can form sort of a Wi-Fi link from person to person if they both have it. So with that, people can share what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're smelling, their thoughts, their memories, their emotions. Now, this sort of technological telepathy is probably not a new idea to any of you. You're an educated crowd. I'm sure it's especially not a new idea if you're well-versed in current American philosophy, such as the great philosopher Keanu Reeves, who famously said when the computer downloaded information into his brain, I know Kung Fu. Right? This, this, this sort of motif exists in science fiction, but what I want to talk about is the science fact of it. Now, there's a spectrum of ways that we can interface with the brain, and most of what we're going to talk about over the next two days is non-invasive, things that are not penetrating the skull. But I want to talk for just a moment about what happens if we actually can put electronics inside the human brain. And this is no longer science fiction. It's happening, or at least uh, with a peripheral nervous system in this case. This is a cochlear implant. A cochlear implant looks like a hearing aid, and it solves a similar problem, but it's radically different. The way that a hearing aid works is it picks up noise from the ambient environment, it cleans up that noise, and then it rebroadcasts it as more noise into the inner ear. Noise is vibrations in airwaves. And inside the ear, uh, hair cells in the inner ear vibrate when they get those vibrations in the air, and that causes a nerve signal that goes to your brain, and then you perceive it. But for some people, they have what's called sensory neural deafness, which means there are no inner ear hair cells remaining. So a cochlear implant works differently. It picks up sound from the environment, it cleans it up, but then it transmits it not as pulses of vibration, but as electrical pulses down a set of electrodes that tap into the auditory nerve that leads directly to the brain. So it translates sound into those electrical impulses. Now there's about 30,000 nerve fibers in the auditory uh, nerve bundle, and there's only about 23 electrodes in most cochlear implants. So you wouldn't think it could do a whole lot, but it actually has a profound impact. It allows people to uh, hear language that without even lip reading that they never could have before, and it's changed the lives of about 200,000 people so far, including people like this five-year-old girl or like the six-month-old boy you're about to see hearing the first sounds in his life. Go, it's coming back on. And he's back on again. See how he turned? Hi, Jonathan. Stop the sucking. Yeah. Hi. Good. Could you good. hear that? <laughs> Hi, okay. sweetie. Could you hear that? <laughs> Hi. So Jonathan here is a cyborg. Right? He, he's the cutest darn cyborg you ever saw. He doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Terminator. And when we talk about these technologies, we tend to go to scary places. Uh, human enhancement for the military, mind control, so on and so on and so forth. And those are worth talking about. But to ground it, the overwhelming driver of neuroscience and neurotechnology is to heal those that need healing. So we've demonstrated 
data into the brain, at least the nervous system, in an auditory modality. But the sense most people say they would most miss is sight. Well, we've demonstrated data in and sight too. This picture appeared on the cover of Wired magazine more than 15 years ago now. It's a guy named Jens Nauman. Jens uh, is blind in this picture. Uh, he was rendered blind uh, in his late teens. At the age of 18, he worked on a railroad, he used a pickaxe, breaking rocks, and one day he broke through the rock, hit a sliver of metal, and a sliver of metal from the rail came up and destroyed one of his eyes. Outdoorsy guy, was not gonna compromise on his outdoor lifestyle. The next year, he was out snowmobiling and had a snowmobile accident, and a piece of clutch flew up and destroyed his other eye. Blind in both eyes at the age of 19. So he persevered. 20 years later, at the age of 39, he was fitted with this system, and probably a, a rather unethical experiment in some ways. It happened in Portugal because it was not uh, under FDA approval. A doctor named William DeBell did this. And what he's got on his glasses there is a, a little uh, video camera. It's like the camera in your phone, only it's remarkably worse because it's uh, all coming up on two decades old now. That picked up photons, right, perceived what was going on. That transmitted it to a computer he wore at his belt. The computer was the size of a small satchel. Now it would be smaller than a dime. That computer then transformed those signals into a different format and then sent them back up into this port in the back of Jens's brain. V1, primary visual cortex, is in the back of your head. Now, there are several billion neurons in just V1. It's just part of the visual processing system. This cable has 256 electrodes, 256 data channels versus billions of neurons. So again, you would not think that it could produce something useful, but it produced what they called limited mobility vision. So what does limited mobility vision look like? Here's what it looks like. Able to very carefully drive and look from my left side to my right side, making sure I was between the row of trees on the right and the building on the left. When I got near um, any obstruction in the front, I would see that there was an obstruction. I would also see the lack of obstructions. And then when I backed up, I would be able to um, inspect for instructions there. It was really a nice feeling. It was really a nice feeling. So that's a blind man driving a convertible. Now you'll notice there's no one else in the car with him. There's, there's no cars in the parking lot. Uh, that's for a reason, because Jens's vision was atrocious with this system. He could see literally in a 16 pixel by 16 pixel grid grayscale. Right? This is not something, in movies it's the bionic eye and you'd trade your eyes for supervision. The reality is sort of the opposite. Right? It's much worse than normal human vision, but it was proof of concept that we can send electrical stimulation into the human brain and have it perceived as video, just as we uh, saw with audio. We've also gotten signals out of the brain. This is work at Brown University. Uh, this woman, Jan Schurman, she has ALS. Uh, she's effectively paralyzed from the neck down, and, but she has a BCI. Again, there's billions of neurons involved in motion control. The brain computer interface she has, you see it in the far right, the little pedestal sitting on her skull, it has 40 electrodes going into her motor cortex. Right? And with that, she is able to control this multi-axis axis robot arm. Now, it turns out motivation is very important in training people to use systems like this. So you see there's a grad student taunting her with a, a piece of chocolate there. He, she's not being taunted, actually. Uh, she chose this as one of the tasks she really wanted to be able to do, was feed herself chocolate. And with enough motivation and the right technology, people can do that. Other patients have chosen a cup of coffee as the first thing they really wanted to pull off. So we've seen data in and now data out of the human brain. But we're not just sensation and motion. This is data back in, by the way. DARPA now has funded work on arms like this that also send sensation information back into the subject's brain so that they can sense how hard they're pushing on something, what they're squeezing, and so on. Uh, but we are more than just motor control and sensation, right? We have these higher functions that make us human as well. 
things like memory. Who knows what movie this is from? Memento, very good. Who knows the name of the actor? Guy Pierce, excellent. Well, let's see if we can go three for three. Who knows the name of the character? That's always a tough one. Lenny. So Guy Pierce plays Lenny. Have you all seen the film? If you haven't, Lenny can't form new long-term memories. He walks into a room, he has working memory, he knows what's going on, but within a minute or so, it's gone. And this is an extreme case, but there are cases like Lenny, and there are millions of cases that are less severe, people that have brain damage, uh, due to, typically, damage to part of their brain called the hippocampus that takes memories, takes current knowledge, and encodes it for the long term. Now, we would like to help these people, most of them victims or uh, subjects of traumatic brain injury, falls, motorcycle accidents, so on. We'd like to help them. So at uh, University of Southern California, a team under the leadership of Theodore Berger has created a hippocampus chip. What they've done is they've taken the structure of the hippocampus, the wiring, if you will, of neurons in that area, and they've engaged in a support swarm of biomimicry. The hippocampus chip effectively mimics the circuit layout of the hippocampus itself. And when they test this in rats, they take a rat that has a legion in its hippocampus, that rat can no longer learn how to run a maze. You put it in a maze, it'll run it, but the second time, it should improve, and it doesn't. So they put this chip in, they sort of bypass that area of the brain, and then the rat can learn again. What they see in the experiments is the rat can learn how to run the maze, that normally it couldn't. But it's more than that because they get some special superpowers out of this. Rats live maybe three years at the maximum. So if you take a rat, have it run a maze, normally the second time it'll be faster and faster. If it runs it a year later, it will have forgotten most of it. That's a third of its life. 30 years have passed. If you take a rat, have it run the maze, and record all that data to the hippocampus chip, and then a year later, you play back that data. It runs the maze like it had just run it seconds ago. They have learned, in a sense, to record memories. Right? Now, how many of you have heard of Kernel, Brian Johnson's company? Brian Johnson, an uh, entrepreneur, he sold Braintree for $800 million to PayPal. He believes that to keep up with AI, we have to engage in human augmentation of human intelligence. So one of the things that Brian has done with this company, just announced a few months ago, is he has licensed this technology to be one of the basis of the future uh, kernel products that he hopes to bring to market. That's a real moonshot, but we see people now working on using this technology to augment our intelligence. And there's reasons to believe that we can. These macaques have been trained on a, basically a, a monkey IQ test, if you will, it's a pick and match test. They also have a chip inside their brains in their prefrontal cortex, where we do a lot of our pattern matching activity. And that chip watches as they play this game. This IQ test is a set of images that they have to remember, and then a high-speed barrage of more images. They have to pick out just the right ones in this high-speed barrage and not the wrong ones. It's a very challenging test, even for humans. Uh, the monkeys play this game, take this test, and the chip learns what their brain activity looks like on a right answer versus a, a wrong answer. It learns that pattern, okay? Then, the monkeys have their performance on the test impaired. It's impaired by giving them large doses of cocaine. So the monkeys believe their performance on the test is going up, when in fact it's going down. Then the chip is switched into an active mode. In the active mode, it can intervene when it believes they're about to get a wrong answer. And when it does so, it rescues the performance of these monkeys. It restores their function back to normal even when they're impaired. And more so, if you use this technology in a monkey that is not currently impaired, on a 100-point scale, it boosts their performance in this test by about 10 points. Okay. So obviously this will lead to the planet of the super-intelligent apes. Or maybe not, because there are challenges when we're talking about this stuff that we'll get to in a moment. 
I believe, though, that the long-term biggest benefit of this will actually be not in enhancement directly, but in communication. That's the theme of, of my novels, and I think of that for a reason. When we think about computing, it used to be used to uh, calculate artillery tables or word process or so on, and we do all of that. But the way that computing has really changed the world is through these devices that let us connect with each other. And we see that potential as well. At Wake Forest University, uh, Sam Deadweiler and colleagues performed this experiment. They have two monkeys in separate soundproofed rooms, and they each have an electrode in their auditory cortex that controls hearing and sound. And when they play a sound for one monkey, they find that the other monkey can hear and recognize that sound, and digital telepathy, if you will. Or uh, this study, this is a work by Miguel Nicolelis, one of the most famous researchers in the field. Nicolelis has two rats in separate but identical cages. And in these cages, a series of lights flash, and if the rat does the right thing and pulls the right lever, it gets a treat. One rat gets trained on how to do this, and it gets the treat all the time. The other rat's never trained, just doesn't really know what's going on. But they both have implants in their motor cortex that controls their paws moving. And when they connect those implants together, then suddenly the rat that's never been trained starts to pull the right lever. Not all the time, but about 70% of the time. Better than chance. So that's cool. What's even cooler is where these rats are, because one of them is in Nicolaitis' lab at Duke University in North Carolina. The other is in his other lab in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Because once you can make the activity of the brain digital, you can do with it anything that you can do with digital information. So the last of these that I think is perhaps the most evocative is that work I told you about rats learning to navigate a maze and the hippocampus chip allowing them to store that information. Well, they went on in Berger's lab to try out a new experiment, which was what happens if you have a second rat that also has a hippocampus chip that doesn't run the maze, but the data flows from the rat that does to the ones that doesn't. The rat that doesn't run the maze now can run the maze as if it has run it before. Maybe not quite that well, but well better than it could with no training whatsoever. So effectively, these rats are saying, I know, a little ways from that still, in a very, very small way. And, and again, when we're talking about this technology actually in your brain, there are some real challenges for to think about. For instance, this is your brain. Who here is excited about voluntary brain surgery? Okay, that's consent, sir. Thank you very much. You'll be contacted as a subject. Um, who's excited now? This, this is what uh, an electrode array looks like. Now, this is an intentionally scary picture. This is blown up quite a lot. You see the two millimeter uh, mark up there. This is what it looks like. But even so, even at this, this tiny size of two millimeters, the very brain areas we want to either stimulate or get data out of are being traumatized by the insertion of these electrodes. There's a chance of bleeding. There's a chance of serious complications. And even if there's not, you are damaging the very tissue you want to interface with. Right? So this is a problem. Now, people are working on various ways to improve this. The most sophisticated invasive brain interface to date has had 256 electrodes. At DARPA, uh, my friend Phil Alvelda, who's been there for the last two years, has been leading a program with the goal of getting to implanted interfaces that don't penetrate and that can talk to one million neurons at a time. Right? And DARPA is pursuing this primarily to help heal people that have had a brain injury. But it opens up a whole raft of applications because the more granularity of data you can get, the more sophisticated the things you can do could be. Jens, the blind guy, instead of having a 16 by 16 pixel grid, could have a 1,000 by 1,000 pixel grid. And then you have vision sort of approaching the level of human vision for instance. And that's not the only uh, effort going on. At Berkeley, uh, Michelle Maharbitz and team have a concept and are now working to implement something called neural dust. Neural dust instead of electrodes would use 
tiny, tiny motes that are sprinkled across the surface of the brain that then communicate via ultrasound, both to get power and to send data to a, a base station, if you will, outside the brain. This is the closest thing to sort of my concept of nexus that I've seen. Or at UPenn, Pitt and Rogers have what they call a conformal interface. This is a set of electrodes on a substrate of silk. They need a small incision in the brain. They then spread this out remotely on top of the structure, and it melts onto the surface of the cortex without causing it damage. And they've tested this in rats now and found it working quite well. Or at Harvard, uh, Charles Lieber, they have a concept of a neural mesh. So this neural mesh is, again, it's implanted not via an invasive brain surgery, but via a needle. Via an injection through the skull of a mouse, they are able to uh, inject this mesh and have it roll out over the surface of the cortex and get data from it for some time. And to give you a sense of the scale, the left side, of course, is this mesh. That right is the tip of an ultrafine syringe. Right, that's the scale we're talking about. And now I told you about Brian Johnson's efforts. You might have heard about this guy. Who's this? Tony Stark? Right, Elon, I don't want to give it away. Uh, so Elon now is talking about can we make this sort of thing real. I think creating a neural lace is a thing that really matters for huma humans to achieve symbiosis with machines. He basically has the same concern that Brian Johnson does, that to keep up with AI, we need to augment ourselves in some way. And the neural lace, by the way, is a concept from the science fiction of Ian M. Banks, an amazing author. Now, all of that is sort of the long-term future, but let's be clear, we are quite a ways from consumer applications with technology in our brain. Uh, 30 years is what Zach said, we don't know. It's going to be quite some while, though people have ambitious efforts going on here. But even when we roll it back to the non-invasive technologies, I see a continuum. I see that what we're working on, what we're talking about here, what we have in the expo, is on a path towards these same sorts of implications. Because we have ways to get data out of the brain with technologies like EEG, for instance, and we've used that to let people uh, remotely control or guide a wheelchair that they're in, or we've used that to monitor their learning rate, or their emotional state, or to get insight into their mental health, or are they about to get an epileptic seizure, right? We've even uh, gone more granular than that. In this experiment, subjects were put inside an fMRI, a non-invasive brain scanner. They were shown a set of video clips, and a machine learning algorithm tried to match that to a set of fuzzed out clips that it had. And while it's very, very far from perfect, you can see that without anything in the brain, this algorithm using fMRI data was able to roughly tell what sort of thing they're looking at. Now, this is big, expensive hardware, uh, but it's evocative. And it's not just the hardware that improves, the software improves. The latest versions of the algorithms they have on this team can tell what letter of the alphabet you're looking at, if you look at it for long enough, and if you're willing to sit inside their, their fMRI. Right? And we sent data uh, bi-directionally. So at the University of Washington, near my home in Seattle, uh, these guys, Rajesh Rao and Andrea Stoko, two professors, did this experiment. They're in separate rooms across campus, about a mile apart, and they're playing a video game. But they're not playing head-to-head, -head, nor are they playing cooperative. They're playing single player. Now, Rajesh Rao on the left, he has the screen. He sees what's happening, and he has this EEG skull cap that picks up his intent, if you will. Andrea Stoko on the right does not have a screen. He does have the fire button, and he has this uh, magnetic stimulator on his skull. And what happens is that when Rajesh Rao sees the bad guy and wants to shoot, he thinks, shoot. And then a magnetic pulse stimulates the part of the motor cortex of Andrea Stoko that controls his right index finger, and he pushes the fire button. Now, it's important that Andrea Stoko does not like, get us tingling and think, oh, Josh wants me to shoot. I should shoot now. No, he just observes as his finger twitches. His finger has become, in some sense, uh, a remote part of Rajesh's body. Right? And we have various ways to modulate the function of the brain. People use uh, transcranial direct current simulation 
now, still in its infancy, the data is a bit contradictory, but in some cases we've seen accelerated learning, improved math skills. The military is looking at it for improving the learning rate of snipers or improving the performance of drone operators, and you can imagine the civilian applications. Or even uh, less mature is transcranial magnetic stimulation that has shown some promise for controlling pain, reducing depression. Uh, some people report, again, tough to replicate, that they're able to go into savant state shut down parts of their brains that interfere with their creativity and flow. But even those exotic technologies really are just extensions of what's happening already. Because with media technology, with information technology, are not our senses the ultimate interface to the brain today? And so when we look at what's happening with neurogaming, with the ability to improve people's cognitive function through brain games, with the ability to modulate what we see and hear and perceive to overcome uh, traumas or phobias. And when we think about this, what we should think about is that the VR gear we have out there is not the VR or AR or media gear of the future because it will shrink. It will become untethered. It will become a longer lasting and lighter and higher resolution and higher fidelity in every way. It may eventually shrink so much that it's indistinguishable from part of our body. We have work happening in those directions. In fact, I think it's extremely likely. So what if we succeed in all of this? What if through some combination of the non-invasive technology and perhaps one day the invasive, we really gain a higher ability to modulate the function of the brain? Well, there's obvious upsides. People who are paralyzed will be able to walk, move again. People with traumatic brain injuries will recover. People with more subtle challenges, whether it's depression or anxiety or OCD, epilepsy, who will be able to function more normally, an uplifting of our mental health. Accelerated learning, as Zach said. What if we can accelerate learning, not just for a few, but upend our educational system? What if we can produce more Einsteins, more Edisons, more Elon Musks? What does that do? And for the ability to upgrade our intelligence, not just to peak human performance, but perhaps to beyond peak human performance. We know there's a huge uh, drive for that because people spend billions of dollars today already on technology or advice that has only a marginal impact. And if we could have a really market significant impact, this would be uh, an incredible domain commercially and for its uh, effect on the world. But these Technologies and these changes, this ability to control ourselves and define ourselves will raise questions. People will start asking, what is our place in the universe? What does it mean to be human if I have these new abilities? Who am I? What is my identity if I can use neurotechnology to change myself? Is my identity fixed? Is it fluid? What does this mean? What is the future of conformity versus individuality. If neurotechnology can change people or sculpt them, will we see more pressure to conform and the application of neurotechnology to uh, force people to conform, subtly or not so subtly? Is that what happens with ADHD treatment in schools? You can look at it either way. Or will the ability to modulate our brains lead to a more ability to be individuals, people being willing to do more outlandish things or to express who they are because they have this technological augmentation of their ability. What does it mean for the concept of justice? If we can explain why someone did something and we can see there was a phenomenon of their brain, are they still guilty? Will we view guilt the same way? if we see, oh, it was this dysfunction in this part of the brain that caused this? Would that be a positive thing for society if we viewed this as a, an illness to get over? Or would softer abilities to change people lead to a sort of soft tyranny where someone might not be sentenced to jail, but they might be sentenced to re-education? by a brain tech. We have soft technologies like uh, trackers, for instance, make it easier, perhaps more socially acceptable to punish people we might not have punished. 
And what about competitive pressures? In our high performance, high stress jobs, will we feel the pressure to use neurotech to augment ourselves or be left behind? And what if that has some negative side effects, right? But perhaps the biggest of these, I think, in, in the modern era, is that of equality versus inequality, the haves and the have-nots. And whenever we talk about human augmentation, this comes up because there is a consistent dystopian trope in fiction that any human augmentation technology will be exclusively that of the rich, who will then use it to get further and further ahead, augment themselves more and more, and lead almost to speciation, right, while the poor get left behind. Now, I though don't think that's the likely outcome. I take heart because we can look at the technology that augments us most today, which is this technology in all of our pockets. And this was once thought of the same way. Anyone remember this movie? Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, greed is good. About a villainous, a billionaire, as you can imagine, on the screen. Uh, and yet, here is Gordon Gecko's phone. This is a Motorola Dynatac. This is a real product. It cost about $5,000. Uh, it had shitty reception. Uh, it, I think the charge time was 12 hours is what it took to charge it. And then it held charge for about half an hour. Right? And it couldn't play Candy Crush or take selfies or Snapchat or any of that. That was the image of a mobile phone owner uh, 20 years ago. This is the median mobile phone owner today. This is a farmer in Bangladesh, right? There are now more people with mobile phones in Africa than North America or Europe. By next year, we project half a billion, not just feature phones, but smartphones in India, right? Almost twice the adult population of the US. To illustrate this more, I went to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. That's ILLIAC, the world's second digital computer. It filled a room larger than this. It weighed uh, tens of tons. It took megawatts of power. And yet that phone is billions of times more powerful. If you wanted to build something with a smartphone's power using ILLIAC technology, it would cost about $100 trillion. It would also be bigger than the Bay Area and consume all the electricity of the state of California. And it still couldn't play uh, Candy Crush. <laughs> so that's what we should think of. Whatever technology costs $100 trillion today in neurotech may well cost a few hundred dollars in generations to come. The cost of computing goes to zero, and so I think the cost of neurotech will go to zero as well. And that means it will be widely disseminated. In fact, Michelangelo predicted this would happen. But we are, one way or another, becoming cyborgs, whether the technology is inside our brains or outside of our brains. And that will lead to a world of greater connection. And smarter, more connected people produce more innovation, more ideas that benefit all of us, produce more economic growth. But I will close with one more thought. I think it's about bigger than just economics. The science fictional view of information technology has almost always been dystopian. 1984, the evil state will use information technology to brainwash and oppress us. Yet in this generation, what we've actually seen is that information technology has led to an outgrowth of empathy. Anger, yes, sectarianism, yes, but more than that, it's led to a world of largely greater tolerance. Right? More acceptance of things we did not accept before. And you can trace this directly to a greater ability of people to communicate. When I look at history, I see that every step forward in civil rights has been facilitated by new technology. Technology has allowed us to hear voices and see faces that were once marginalized, to recognize them as human as well. Technology now is on the verge of also allowing us to modulate ourselves and seek things that we want, which include tranquility. Technology has made it possible to literally see out of the eyes of others. Well, actually, that's been figurative for a long time, but it may well become actual in the coming years, whether through VR and AR or direct implants in our brains. So I'm hopeful that if we use it right and develop it right, that technology 
of this sort, neurotechnology, can actually lead us to a world of more compassion and more empathy. And I hope that all of you will join me in trying to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.